Well, number one, he says, you know all about that because you know about putting antifreeze or alcohol in your radiator, right? Lowers the melting point. In this particular case, however, it has this singularity, and I want to know why. And you know what he told me? He says, because the good Lord made it that way. Well, I went along and got a little bit more education, and I found that there's a reason behind this. The reason that that has the lowest melting point is because it's the lowest free energy configuration. And to understand that, you've got to do a lot of thermodynamics. And after you're all through doing all that thermodynamics, then my students today say, now, first upon, will you tell me why that is the lowest free energy configuration? And guess what I have to tell them? Because the good Lord made it that way. I, don't re I really don't know. We don't know the 100% answers for that at the moment. And there's always a question behind a question behind a question. That particular diagram is called a eutectic type diagram. But it has two terminal solid solutions. And if you look at it again, you find that they exist on the termini of the diagram, the ends of the diagram. So on this end of the diagram, there's a solid solution. And that's the solid solution alpha, everything in here. Over here we have a solid solution and it's the solid solution, it's beta, over here. <coughs> so, we have an alpha solid solution and a beta solid solution that are combined to give us the two phases that are going to be anywhere between here and that will form this particular eutectic. Now, wouldn't it be nice to be able to crawl in this pot of metal and see what's going to go on as that material solidifies these two different phases? And if you could, here's what you'd find out. You'd find that there'd be a moving wall, a solid wall that's moving ahead in the liquid. But that solid wall would be like a bunch of fingers. And you would have copper on one side, or alpha phase on here, where my little finger is, and then a beta phase, and then an alpha phase, and a beta phase, and an alpha phase. And so it will come out like sheets of material growing like that. And if I polish it and etch it, then it will look like a thumbprint. It'll like, be like a thumbprint structure. <clears throat> and we call it a lamella structure. And it's a eutectic, characteristic eutectic structure. The word eutectic is an adjective. And so we have to say eutectic structure, eutectic reaction. That means we're going from the liquid to the solid state or vice versa. A eutectic temperature, a eutectic composition. And we call the whole thing a eutectic diagram. Because the word eutectic in this case is an adjective. Solidifying a metal with impurities causes those impurities to be excluded, thus purifying the metal. A eutectic composition can be identified on an equilibrium diagram because it has a unique melting point. The eutectic also has the lowest melting point because it contains the lowest free energy configuration. The characteristic eutectic structure looks like a fingerprint and is termed a lamellar structure. Well, is that the only kind of diagram we have? Well, it's not. But let's look at the lever rule now to see what we can do about some calculations because this is what troubles many non-metallurgists that are trying to work in the field of metallurgy. <coughs> so in the next slide, we find out that we can, let's say, approach the problem to make a calculation. Now, I'm going to be redrawing a part of this in a moment. But what we're really looking at here now is a solid solution type diagram. And I am interested in finding out if I possibly can at, the temper at this particular temperature, T2, I guess it is, uh, exactly how much liquid I'm going to have and exactly how much solid I'm going to have. I'm also going to be interested in things like what's the composition of the liquid and what's the composition of the solid. Well, look at this. Let's suppose I'm just at that temperature and this is the composition I'm interested in, that solid is in equilibrium with that liquid. By the inverse lever rule, the length of the line from here to here over the length of the line from here to there tells me how much liquid I'm going to have, right? That's what we decided in just doing the travel by car. So that's, that's the ratio of the liquid. The amount of solid we're going to have is the length of the line from here to here over the length of the line from here to here. That is, the, the total length of the line with this length over top of it will tell us how much solid we're going to have. You can measure that on the equilibrium diagram, 
convert it to a number, you come up with a percentage. Now suppose you wanted to know what the composition was of, let's say, that particular liquid. <clears throat> well, what we have done here is we have the equilibrium diagram. We've identified two points on it. This is the alloy we were talking about. We've identified a point, let's say, right here for solid and right here for liquid. And I want to know the composition. I just drop the line down from those two points and I can tell you how much A, how much B I'm going to have in a liquid because the A content in the liquid is merely expressed by the number which is LB over AB times 100. That tells me, that will tell me exactly how much A, the percent of A I have in that liquid. I can do the same thing for the solid and get the composition of the solid. I can find out the extent of the segregation I have, if I want to. <coughs> well, is that all we have to, to concern ourselves with in, in the diagram? And the answer is, no, it's not. Um, we have other kinds of diagrams, and in the next slide we see that we have <coughs> a diagram that's called a peritectic diagram. Again, we're going to have things like um, liquidus. That's the liquidus line. Everything above that's going to be a liquid. We have the solidus line, and that's this line. goes here, across there, to that point, and then down like this. That's the solidus line. Between the liquidus and solidus, we'll always have a mixture of two materials, two states even, liquid and a solid. So it's going to be this solid solution, which is alpha, and this liquid, which is over here. A composition of which we could determine any, for any composition we have in between. When we get to this particular temperature, if we had a composition, which is that alloy, X, right here, goes right through that point, which is called a peritectic point, we would find out that we would have in equilibrium a solid of that composition and a liquid of this composition. They're coexisting now. They're just sitting there together in this big pot of metal. But they react. The solid reacts with the liquid and it produces a different solid, which is this solid, beta. And it uses up all the liquid in doing that. In order to get that reaction, if you will visualize with me now that here's a packet of the solid, my fist, and all around it is liquid material. And I'm going to have a reaction between a solid of this composition and a liquid of the composition wrapped around it. Where is it going to react? Right where the two meet, right? It's the only place it can react. So the surface of this thing is going to con be converted to beta phase. Make sense? The surface. But how about the inside? Well, the inside can't be converted until it gets through that barrier to get to the outside, or the liquid gets through the barrier to react with the material on the inside. So it's very difficult for this reaction to go to completion. And therefore, it's called a peritectic, because the word peritectic means wall around. So we have a wall around this material that wants to react. And frequently we see these structures, instead of being lamella, or let's say layered structures, or thumbprint-like structures, we see that it's a blocky type material, little, isle, little crystalline islands that have walls around it. And then the material that was liquid on the outside, if we look back into the diagram now, to find out what happens to it, we find out it just keeps on solidifying. The liquid was here, the reacting liquid. It can no longer react with the solid that's on the inside, so it begins to cool off, and this part of the curve is just another solid solution curve. So it, the, the phase, which is the alpha phase, this phase, we would see in the microscope with this wall wrapped around it, the peritectic wall of beta, but then around that would be more beta in which we'd have a competition concentration gradient as it cooled off as we have described it before. Well, this is called a peritectic reaction <coughs> and there are really uh, more diagrams than this and you can imagine the problem we're going to have if we put them together three at a time. They do that for you in your uh, manuscript uh, in, the, in the data book you have. Uh, in the back of it you'll see ternary diagrams put together. The inverse level rule still applies. The percentage, ternary percentage diagram is you work just like you do the binary system. 
But the diagrams become three-dimensional and become more complex to analyze. <coughs> well, you remember now when we started to talk about brain size and brain structure, one of the things that we did was to say that uh, it makes a whole lot of difference what the grain size is, but it also makes a whole lot of difference what the chemical composition is, not just the grain size, but the chemical composition of that grain. It also makes a lot of difference to us how fast that material cools because it will tell us whether it's in equilibrium or not equilibrium. Just go back to what I told you about the powdered metals. If we get the powdered metal structure, then we can put together a homogeneous mix. All right? But what, what's going to happen now if we are interested in what the solidification rate was of, let's say, a casting? We want to know how fast it cooled off. Well, it's been found out that we can look at the dendrite and we get some idea of how fast or how slow that material solidified by looking at the secondary arm spacing. Also, from the character of the dendrite, we can tell whether the material was pure or impure. And the next slide we see, <coughs> what happens if we looked at a dendrite that is solidifying in, in a bath now. So we're moving uh, into the liquid material, the liquid metal, which is here, from a cold wall. And by the way, they will line up exactly like that. They, they line up so that the major tree will be sticking out like that. Each one of those little... Uh, sections, by the way, is a separate crystal. They're slightly, they're oriented slightly different by rotation about this axis. So we get a column of growth crystal, and that column of growth crystal can give us all sorts of headaches when we get to talking about um, manufacturing a steel or preparing steel ingots. But these, these crystals now will grow with a specimen axis that's uh, pre-selected. It will, it tries to be a certain crystallographic orientation. So I could make a statement that in the cubic materials, that direction will generally be a cube direction, a specific direction. But the little dendrite arms that are crossed over here, if we measure the distance between those, we can make a calculation to find out how fast they were growing. But remember now that these things are sort of perfectly straight. And if you look at the next slide, which is an impure material, same situation now. Uh, here's, this is an ing ingot that's solidifying. This is liquid metal over in here, cold metal wall. Now the dendrite's trying to grow, but now the dendrite is no longer a perfectly straight little thing. It's kind of mismatched, bent over, tries to grow one way. A and why? The reason is that as the material solidifies, it's burping out an impurity. It's giving up an impurity, right? And as it gives up this particular impurity, then what's growing here, the solid that's growing, is growing into a different alloy composition than it grew into before. And so, in characterizing the materials now, we don't, we don't have to concern ourselves with just grain size, but we have to concern ourselves with all of these micro situations that will occur in the material. In addition to supplying information about the composition of liquids and solids, the lever rule can be applied to phase diagrams to indicate the ratio of solid and liquid present at a given temperature. In the peritectic material, blocky crystalline islands surround the solid and create a wall that keeps the solid from reacting with the liquid. It is difficult.